to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We appreciate you helping to make the world a healthier place. And today, perhaps more than ever, we truly do mean the world because today we're talking about how the food that you eat in impacts not just your own health, but literally the health of the entire world and the 8 billion people who live here. So what are we talking about? Well, we're going to take the standard American diet. We're going to take the vegetarian, the plant-based diets. We're going to put them head to head. and We're going to see which one has the greater impact on the environment. We're talking about greenhouse gases. We're talking about carbon footprints. We're talking about resources. And we're going to talk about just how big of a difference what you eat can make. And breaking it all down for us is the author of Your Body Imbalance, Dr. Neil Barnard, is with us today. And if there's a question that you would like to ask Dr. Barnard, go ahead, post it right now in the comments or in the chat and we will get to as many as we possibly can and if you're more of a social media type person you can also tweet me your questions or send them to me on instagram at chuck carroll wlc so let's dive right into everything right now and welcome dr barnard back to the exam room live sir good to see you good to see you chuck this is a really important and fascinating topic, and I'm so glad that we're doing this show. We do it every year around Earth Day, and it never ceases to amaze me just how big of an impact what we eat does in fact have on the planet. And there are so many factors that go into it. So I'm glad that you're here today because I know that this is also something that you're very passionate about. Absolutely. It's it's so important. It affects us in so many ways. And also when people start to recognize the impact of what they're eating on the environment, it motivates them to eat better and take care, take better care of themselves and their families. All right. Well, let's go ahead and dive right in and start answering some questions and raising the health IQs here. Let's start with the question from Sasha. She says, people say that food choices affect the environment, but I don't really know what that means. Which foods are we talking about and which parts of the environment? are you talking about? Okay, great, great question. You know, you think about air pollution, water pollution, all these, these kinds of things. What are we really talking about? I have to tell you, I get my big reminder every time I go back to my childhood home. I grew up in North Dakota. And if you fly in there and you get, uh, you're, you're driving from the airport into the town, you, you'll pass by uh, fields. And the fields are corn fields and soybean fields and so forth. And you'll notice how beautiful they are. And then suddenly it hits you. The reason they're beautiful is as far as the eye can see, all the crops are identical, meaning they're GMO. They're genetically modified organisms. And what that really means is they're not for you. They're, they're not for human consumption. All that corn, all that soy is raised for cattle um, and for chickens and for, for pigs. And so they're consuming all that. And to make it grow, um, you add fertilizer often pesticides, and then you add water. You've got, to, you've got to irrigate them. If it's not raining enough, you irrigate them. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, what does that mean for the, the ground that it's on? Well, just thinking about the water, let's say for comparison that you were gonna brush your teeth and kind of leave the faucet running the whole time and you're sort of luxuriating as you're brushing your teeth. You could use up a gallon of water. Let's say you take a good long shower about 20 gallons of water. Wash your car, 65 gallons of water. But to make the feed grains you need to raise one pound of chicken, it's about 420 gallons of water. Yeah, one pound of chicken. It's because of all the irrigation that you need for the, the feed crops that go into them. Now, what if it's a pound of beef? 5,000 gallons of water. Okay, now water is can be reclaimed. It goes into the, 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 the groundwater. You can, you can theoretically get it back. But here's the problem that water is irrigated in um, and then it trickles into the little streams and into the rivers and it carries the pesticides with it. It carries the fertilizer with it. And if you put a bunch of fertilizer in your river, algae will grow. And as it overgrows and then dies, it ends up killing off the other life forms that are there. And if you're in the middle of North Dakota, uh, the water ends up eventually draining uh, through a slightly circuitous route into the Mississippi. And it gets flushed out underneath Louisiana into the Gulf of Mexico. And there is a, a dead zone, 8,000 square miles in the Gulf of Mexico, entirely as a result of all the fertilizers and so forth that we washed in there. And so the, the problem is we're raising all these feed crops, we're raising it to feed chickens, uh, 
pigs, cows, and that's just destroying the ground, the earth, and the waterways. And then the last thing is the air that we're breathing and so forth, the, the emissions, the greenhouse emissions that are, that are uh, a big problem with global climate change. Uh, a new study that came out showing that if you're a meat eater, the emissions that you're responsible for are 59% higher than if you're not a, if, than if you're following a vegan diet. And why would that be? Because cows belch out methane and methane is a very powerful greenhouse uh, gas. So this is all bad news. Good news is that you can change this today just by choosing a completely plant-based diet. All right. Uh, so that study that you, you just referenced there, 59, almost 60% difference there. I think that that's, that's a huge, huge, huge difference between the two. So when you're talking about a planet that is inhabited by almost 8 billion people, if you get a 60% savings there, if everybody were to adjust your diet, what do you think the net impact would be on the health of the planet? Well, the impact would be huge. And we also have to think, uh, yeah, I think it's really an open question whether it's too late to save the environment. People will say, you know, we've got to, we've got to knock it down by 2025 or 2030. Um, we have already seen huge climate change already. So it may be that it's not totally reversible, but if anything, we've got to do what we can to slow it down. And while we're waiting for everyone to change their car buying preferences or cap a smokestack or whatever, the choice that we can make and, and don't need the government to, to tell us to make, is what we're going to eat. And when people get away from the animal products, their emissions go down, as, as we were saying, you, you're cutting it to less than half. And what that matter, the reason that matters is that of all the different contributors to climate change, transportation and so forth, the food uh, part of this is one of the biggest ones. It's at least a third of the total. And if I can take that chunk out, then we're, then we're making some progress. Um, let's go ahead uh, and do some follow-up questions here from some of the things you've already touched on. Brittany is wondering about uh, pesticides, and since they're used to raise crops, wouldn't everybody be better off just eating meat? Okay, all right. I, I see what you mean. You know, if the pesticides are on the crops, you should eat the pork chop instead. Um, the problem is that to, to make that pork chop or to make beef or to make chicken, the animals, they're not ordering room service. They are, they are eating the crops they are given. And so the amount of crops you have to raise in order to make meat is far greater than the crops you would need to raise if people would just eat the plants directly. Um, and in fact, this goes way, way back. Francis Moore LePay wrote probably maybe 40 years ago, a book called Diet for a Small Planet, saying that if people were eating plant-based diets, the amount of surface area that you would need just to raise crops for, for human consumption uh, would be small, much, much smaller than feeding the grains to a chicken to get the little bit of chicken meat out. So no, you're, you're always better off going to a totally plant-based diet. And you were talking about the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Mark is wondering whether there are dead zones in other places throughout the world. Yeah, there sure are. This is um, the one that I described here is where we we're basically treating the Mississippi River like it's toilet. And we're just flushing it down the bottom of the country. And that's that's what we're doing. And then, of, of course, people who eat fish are concerned because the fish are living in what's now the human sewer, um, getting not only you know heavy metals, but all kinds of other things. But yes, th these uh, occur throughout the world. And the driver behind it is that animal agriculture's use of pesticides and especially fertilizer ends up contaminating the waterways. You, you can't go through with a tweezer and pick up the little molecules of fertilizer that you threw into the river. Um, they're there and they're despoiling, despoiling the environment. Fair question coming in from uh, Moj here at 1209. Moj is wondering about the energy and the water that is used for making plant milks like almond milk and stuff like that. Is that a lesser of two evils or what kind of impact are we looking at there? Yeah, um, I think these are reasonable questions. Almonds uh, are a pretty big um, water consumer. Um, although, as, as I mentioned earlier, the water itself isn't destroyed. I mean, it, it ends up, it's still in the ecosystem and can, 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 be, can be used. But the point I was trying to make is that when, when we're using an enormous amount of water, we're throwing it onto the fields, it ends up washing these chemicals with it. Um, but your question is a fair one. Um, almonds are a pretty big water consumer and much more so than the other plant-based milks. Uh, you mentioned fishing just briefly a little bit ago. So let's take a question from Sandra, who's wondering, okay, well, we've talked about cattle. We've talked about beef, uh, pork. What about fishing? How does that affect the environment? 
Fishing is an amazing thing. There, 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 there are two ways that you could get fish. Um, one is that they're wild caught. And the way they're wild caught is, there, there are a couple of, of means. One is, um, if you look at these huge fishing operations, they might use what's called a purse seine net. A, um, a boat will go out and they'll lay out a, a, a net that's this enormous thing and the fish get inside. And then just like a string purse, you pull it up and all the fish are there, including the trash fish and the target fish and, and so forth. Uh, there's another way of, of capturing fish in the wild called bottom trawling. And one boat or sometimes two will drag a huge, enormous uh, scoop basically along the ocean floor, breaking up the coral, destroying the plants and getting whoever is down there. And it's sort of the equivalent of taking a lawnmower just through the forest and just running through and, and, and destroying things. And of course, more recently, people are having fish farms. And if you ever got the opportunity to go into one of these places and you took your snorkel and your mask and you dived into the fish farm, you would be horrified. It's the equivalent of a factory farm, except instead of it being chickens all jammed together or pigs jammed shoulder to shoulder, it's fish in that kind of situation. And they are fed uh, crops. They are fed antibiotics because they're all crowded together. The water is murky and disgusting. And um, I think nowadays people are really realizing that, that the, the fish industry is one of the most environmentally destructive industries and also one of the most polluted industries uh, because fish are only, the, the only carnivores that people eat. And so when you're eating a fish, you're eating the whatever came up the food chain from that the tiny fish to the bigger fish to the bigger fish to the bigger fish. And the person at the top of the food chain is actually a baby. Woman is breastfeeding. All of the, the DDT, the, the, the pesticides and so forth that she has consumed and are now in her breast milk, about a half of her load of those things go to her firstborn child, what she's accumulated over time. So um, it's good to, good to get off that food chain and eat the plants directly. And you talk about those fish farms. When the documentary Seaspiracy came out last year or the year before, for the first time, it really showed a lot of us what a fish farm actually looks like. And it is, it was really jarring to see this because it, it wasn't just the fact that these fish are in a, a really large pool that's surrounded by a net, um, but it, it was the murky water you were talking about, but how diseased a lot of these fish looked despite the fact that they were being fed antibiotics. And now when I say a pool, I'm not talking about like a pool that you have in your backyard. It's, it's basically a pool in a lake or in a river or something like that. So would I be correct in assuming the abundance of antibiotics, all of the things that the diseased fish are emitting into the water, all of that then eventually trickles out into the water that you and I are consuming? Yeah, these, these places are really shocking, and, and uh, you'll sometimes see them if you drive along coastal areas, you'll see them. And there, there was one other, I think, really particularly good point that that film made. So many people won't use a plastic straw because they've heard that these plastic straws end up in the trash and they can end up in the waterways, and you can, you can imagine them floating in the ocean. And so, correctly, they won't use a straw. However, um, the biggest contributor, or one of the biggest contributors of plastic in the oceans, far greater than any straw you ever consumed, was the cast off nets and other equipment that is used to, to net these animals. And enormous, enormous amounts of plastic end up in the waterways. And it's all because of people's uh, appetite for fish. So it's time to break up with a kind of bad culinary love affair. Here's a great question from Cobweb at 1211. Cobweb is wondering what is better for the environment, organic or non-organic? Yeah, well, organic is, is going to always be better. And some people will say, well, it, it costs more, and, and it may, although the costs are typically coming down, and often the differential is not so much um, that it's of concern. So if you have a choice, I would always suggest getting organic. Uh, speaking of organic, Tiffany has a question. How can you tell if vegetables are organic or not if there's not a label on them? Ah, I feel your pain. You're at the market, and somebody's... <laughs> <laughs> the products have been mushed, pushed around and there's no sign and you're looking at this apple. It's really good looking, you know, but is it organic or isn't it organic? Here's what you do. If there's no sign, um, there's a little sticker. It's the PLU sticker, the price lookup sticker. Got a number on it. 
If the number starts with nine, it's organic. Um, if it's any other number, it's not organic. So there you go. Love that. Uh, what about uh, similarly, uh, Svetlana here is wondering whether or not, uh, or how to tell whether or not something is GMO versus non-GMO. Great question. By law, it does not have to be um, disclosed. Um, so um, in, in fact, you see this in the meat aisle. People will say, well, I wanted organic um, beef or whatever, which is really just a misnomer. Um, but they, they have no, they're under no obligation to really tell you if these animals have been eating uh, GMO crops, which of course they have. Um, however, uh, you go to the store and you want to get um, a, a plant and, or, or a plant product like tofu. And if it is organic by law, it cannot be genetically modified. So that's really the easiest way. They will often say non-GMO on there, but if they don't, look for the word organic. If it's organic, it is not GMO. I have a question for you. I, I wanna switch back to beef right now. You, you said uh, grass-fed, I believe, was one of the things that you, you, you touched on earlier. And I'm just wondering, right? When, when you think about grass-fed beef, the, the picture that is painted for us is that this is a cow that is in an open pasture, just as happy as could be, an abundance of grass. And that somehow is not just healthier for us, but also healthier for the environment. Is that a lot of slick marketing and wishful thinking, or is there actually something to that? Yeah, it's marketing and it's not very slick um, <laughs> because the, the problem with it is that cow is, is belching methane regardless of what that cow eats. So if the cow is on a feedlot or out in the pasture, um, they, are, they are ruminant animals. And that means that every minute of every day, uh, they are belching out methane. It's coming out the front end. And at any given time, we have, what, 90 million cows in this country, something like that. Um, and I mean, they outweigh the mass of humans quite substantially. If you put, if you put all the cows on one side of the balance and the humans on the other side, they, they outweigh us and they are belching methane. Um, and this does not mean that we need to switch to chicken or switch to pork or whatever, because all of those animals are being raised in ways that consume enormous amounts of resources and not to mention what they're doing to your health and what they're doing to the animals themselves. I have to tell you, Chuck, uh, when I was a kid, you know, I grew up in North Dakota and I drove a, a load of cattle to um, East St. Louis with my uncle. Um, and because, you know, this the family business was uh, raising cattle. And when, the, you know, these cattle were um, pasture raised. And when, when they get there, you, you could see what, what is happening. First of all, the animals come off the, the truck, half of them, or well, not half of them, but some of them have um, injuries, they got broken legs because of the transport process is not a kind one. Um, secondly, you can see how the farmers have been manipulating, whether they were grain fed or, or um, um, pasture raised because they would hose them down to, to hose away the, the, the droppings that they, that they had so nobody could really tell what had gone into them. And I found myself just thinking that this is a, an industry that's cruel, that does not really um, differentiate marketing from 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 the, the the truth of of what they're selling and it's not good for the animals it's not good for the environment it's certainly not good for your coronary arteries so those types of feelings they they were conjured up in you early in life because we've heard you tell the story also about when you were in medical school and the horrific experiments that they were doing on on dogs um but you, you found that kind of compassion much 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 sooner than that well i got to tell you chuck I, I was a slow learner in many ways um in Fargo, I mean, I, I never heard of a vegetarian. <laughs> I never heard of it. I don't think the word vegan existed, maybe, or if it did, it wasn't on my uh, radar. And in the in the fall, you know, my dad would bring his kids out, me and my brothers, and we would shoot the ducks who would come over and the, the geese that would, they, they would be leaving Canada and they'd be migrating south. And I have to say, since that time, I've found myself reflecting on the fact there is probably no animal more gentle than a duck. Um, trying to get out of the cold weather and uh, for us to try to blow them out of the sky for a meal that we certainly had plenty of things that we could have eaten instead. Um, I've regretted all of those kinds of things. But um, the, the good news is that even though we all kind of grew up with diets that weren't necessarily environmentally friendly or kind to the animals or good for us, um, now's the time to make some changes in our lives. 
Man, you hit the nail on the head. We all grew up that way. I mean, the vast majority of us, 99.999%. And there are people who are in those shoes right now who have family members. Let's take this question from Richard Hubbard at 1209. Richard says, I have a family that says that even if the whole world would go vegan, it still wouldn't help the planet. He said it drives him crazy. How can he convince them otherwise? So basically, I guess the, the simpler way to say this is, how do we begin to have that dialogue with other people who don't yet understand? Understand the connection here between food and the environment? You know, it's a $64,000 question. Um, I, I do think that, that by the time people are two or three years of age, they have very strong feelings about what they're eating. They want to eat the things they're used to, and they carry those, those feelings with them later on. So you're going to challenge people and say, maybe the chicken doesn't want to be thrown into the transport vehicle, or maybe the cow is belching methane. And people will rationalize things. They'll say, it, uh, where do you get your protein? It, the, the, the other thing won't taste good or whatever, whatever the rationale is. Um, I think what we have to do is to just try different things. Uh, sometimes in our lives, we have to appeal to someone else. So when people hear your argument, it's one thing, but when they see see spiracy or cowspiracy or what the health or forks over knives or the, or the game changers, when they hear it from somebody else, sometimes it's more compelling uh, sometimes people uh, are convinced through their taste buds. Uh, you bring a product home, uh, a, a veggie sausage instead of the pork sausage, have everybody try it. And there's really no convincing. People just taste it. And if they like it, eventually things will kind of melt away. So uh, everyone tries their own way of, of convincing people of these things. One, one last thing I, I might mention, and Chuck, I might have told you about this before. My mother had a really high cholesterol level. Wouldn't listen to a word I said. Uh, you know, my mother grew up in the Midwest and, and the whole idea of not eating meat and cheese was kind of alien to her. But, you know, I love my mother. She's got this high cholesterol level. She's got to do something. So um, I would encourage her to try a vegan diet. Just try it for three weeks. You know, it'll change your life. Da, da, da. Finally, I was thinking to myself, Mom, you know, I'm a doctor. <laughs> I've been funded by NIH. Why don't you listen to me? And I, I got to tell you, Chuck, I realized why she wasn't listening to me. I was her third born child. And if you ever open the family photo album, Chuck, you got a lot of pictures of number one and you got a few pictures of number two, but to, to look to find number three, you got to look in the index. In other words, your parents don't listen to you when you're, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. So anyway, it didn't matter how many books I read. My brother just wasn't paying attention. So I, here, I finally found the trick. You take a book, you give it to your mother, but you put a post-it on the cover and the post-it says, mom, I love you so much. And I thought of you when I got to page 51 of this book. And I thought of you again on page 89 and page 120. And you put post-its on each of those pages. You give it to her and you go home. She will call you a week later and she'll say, honey, I read that book six times. I couldn't figure out why you were thinking of me at each of those pages. I see kind of, but I didn't really get it. And you tell her, mom, I just wanted you to read the book. And I knew if, if I put, put the, you know, they'll read the page 59, they'll try to think, what's this about? Or you give them a copy of Seaspiracy and you say, mom, that was you at about one minute, you know, one hour, 10, 10 minutes into it. That was you. She'll call you. She'll say, I watched that movie twice. I couldn't really see how I figured into that. Say, mom, I just wanted you to watch it. So, anyway, try that. Um, it's hard to convince our family members, but we do the best we can. Man, I'm, I'm just laughing over here because I'm thinking, man, you had a hard time getting through and you were the third child. And I'm thinking of my aunt Catherine, who was the last of 11 children from my grandparents. Like, did they ever hear a word that she said the poor thing? I Good mean, luck. that is that is crazy time. Um, I want to take oh, a but I got to tell you, Chuck, I'm sorry. I know we got questions, but I got to tell you the follow up yeah. um, is that my mother finally did change her diet. Um, she went back to the doctor and the doctor checked her cholesterol level and her doctor called her up after she went back home from the test. And he said, your cholesterol has dropped so much. I am sure it's a mechanical failure of our cholesterol testing machine. Please come back and get retested. My mother called me up laughing and she said, what a foolish doctor. Doesn't he know that a vegan diet will drop your cholesterol? So anyway. 
Score you can win for your mom. Yeah, go ahead. That's, right. mom you can win. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, let's see. Anton 1219. Oh, this is really nice. This program always strengthens my motivation and my intention to talk with others on these topics. Thank you, Anton. I greatly appreciate that, my friend. And we also have people checking in from around the world. We have people today joining us from Colombia, from Canada, from France, from Spain, literally all over. And uh, pretty much every state here in the U.S. So guys, greatly appreciate you joining us here today. The Exam Roomies, you guys make the show what it is. Uh, also, this episode of The Exam Room, I wanted to let you know, is brought to you by Marty Rosenthal. So Marty, appreciate your support of The Exam Room today. Uh, question from the gallery here today, Dr. Barnard, they're wondering if there are any vegetables that have a greater impact on the environment or are there ones that have less of a carbon footprint that they should really try to target? Oh, that's a that's a terrific question. It, every crop is is different, and um, there are different ways of looking at it. One is which are the ones where pesticides end up being used more than than for other crops. There are some crops that are relatively resilient. The insects don't go after them too much, and so there's a relatively low use of pesticides. There are others that are very fragile, um, and where pesticides are used more. Um, I've got to tell you, I think probably the best list I have seen is by the Environmental Defense Fund. And if you go to, uh, what is the edf.org probably, um, they list the dirty dozen and it'll show you the ones where it's a big issue, but you can almost predict it because if you think about say a spinach leaf, it's very thin. An insect could eat right through it very rapidly. Okay, those green leafy vegetables might be ones where the pesticides are used a fair amount. Apples, same story. Um, so what does that mean? It means that those are ones where you really want to support the farmers who are doing organic agriculture. So don't skip those products. Eat your green leafy vegetables, eat your apples, but support the farmers who are, who are using organic techniques. Uh, we have uh, now we have uh, South Africa is checking in. Reiki from South Africa checking in today. Thank you so very much for being part of the exam room. Um, Kathy wants to get dirty here and go back to the methane emissions. She's wondering uh, whether the huge manure piles are also contributing to the uh, emitting of methane. Uh, the, yes, to a very limited degree, but but the methane really is coming out the front end. Um, they are it's being belched up. Um, but manure is a problem. Uh, you, Americans eat a million animals per hour, a, mil a million per hour. And so each one of them is defecating and it's a big issue. And so with cattle, nitrous oxide uh, is, a, is a contributor that comes from manure. And in chickens, um, it's a huge issue. Chickens, a ch whole chicken farm is cleaned out, or not cleaned out, the chickens are removed after six weeks of life. That's right, a chicken lives only six weeks. When they are thrown into the transport truck, you go into that chicken shed and you know what's all over the floor. And so they, you bring a equipment in and you pull all that manure out and it's actually put into something called deep stacking uh, where they pile up the, the chicken, let's call it chicken litter, um, several feet high and they let it heat up, um, which happens spontaneously with these big um, loads. And then you've got this manure there, you got to do something with, I mean, it's, it's there, it's, you can't sell it on eBay. So what do you do? I am not making this up. Researchers have found that you can sell chicken manure to cattle farmers who will mix it with their cattle feed and that the cattle will not detect it up until a certain percentage is reached. And so that is one of the principal means that chicken farmers are using to get rid of the uh, chicken waste is, yes, they are feeding it to other animals. Am I cheering you up? I hope this isn't exactly your lunchtime, but um, that is what's happening. Okay, so hold on. I I'm just going to put this in blunt terms here. They are selling chicken feces to cattle farmers who then sell, uh, who then feed the feces to the cattle. That's what's happening here? They, they feed it up until the time when the cow will no longer eat it. Yes. So Two. pretty much every burger you ever, yes. And, and I know what you're, you're thinking, it's not only disgusting, but what went into the chicken? Think of the chemicals that went into the chicken, um, all the things that were in the feed and so forth. Yes, it's just, you're creating this crazy um, uh, food chain that's bigger and bigger and bigger because you, yes, exactly. To what benefit, man? <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an economic benefit. If you're, if you're a, a, a cattle farmer and you think, if I'm gonna buy you, cow, uh, soybeans, corn, and I can get some chicken dung from the guy down the 
down the road and he wants to get rid of it. He might, you know, he'd almost pay me to take it. So I send my truck over there. I pay him a few bucks. I mix and and yes, I'm not making this up. It's mixed with chicken feed. This is done routinely. Um, yeah. Yeah. I uh, yeah, you just stopped the show, uh, Dr. Barnard. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know where to go after this. No, we, I, mean, I got to tell you, Chuck, we, we wrote a whole expose on this and published it in the scientific literature years ago. Um, and it has not stopped um, because because think about it. What are you going to do if we continue to raise, slaughter and eat a million animals every hour? Each one of them is consuming resources. Each one of them is putting out feces. And so one of the ways that people get rid of it is they feed it to other animals. It's not stopping. It's getting worse. Okay. But what about, uh, Susie is wondering then, what about uh, manure then being used for uh, vegetable gardens to, to fertilize the soil there? Is that detrimental? Is that on the cleaner end of things? Well, people will use it um, and they justify it as being sort of a time-honored practice. I have to say it is wildly oversold. I mean, as a concept. Um, Frankly, um, you do not need animal manure to raise your roses or your corn or anything like that. And um, a mighty oak in the forest was not waiting for a squirrel to poop in order to, to, to grow. Um, animal manure just happens to be a convenient, cheap source of some nutrients that, <laughs> that uh, gardeners have used. Totally unnecessary. And, and there is plant-based uh, sources of uh, a fertilizer that I would certainly prefer, and 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 by the you, you don't particularly want the things that are in manure in your garden or where your kids play or whatever. We have time for what a, a cheerful more. show this is, Chuck. I, I know, man. Say. I'm just boy, I'm not feeling good about life today. Uh, <laughs> we have time for a couple more, so go ahead, post a cheery question in, in the chat box for us. Um, my goodness, uh, we do have a couple of people who have been wondering about uh, the process uh, processing of food and and how that may contribute also to carbon footprints, and greenhouse gas emissions, and the like. Um, they were asking specifically about a lot of the processed plant based foods that are out there and. And if there have been any studies comparing those to meat, traditional meat that's being sold, um, the the carbon footprint of the pl of plant based meat substitutes, the, the carbon footprint is dramatically lower than the, for the meat itself. So if you are switching from a meat burger to a plant based burger, the carbon footprint is dramatically lower. You are doing a great thing for the environment, no matter what. Because and the processing that goes into it is what it's taking the soybeans and grinding them. It's not really a big deal or taking the, the wheat and um, turning it into wheat gluten or something like that. It's not you're not talking about huge processing that has a big environmental cost. So it's always a good shift. That said, um, there are some that are healthier than others. And so I would go for the ones that have fewer ingredients and especially uh, the ones that are lowest in saturated fat. So that's going to set aside the ones where they've packed in a lot of coconut oil, coconut oil and that kind of stuff. All right. Fair enough, man. You know what? Let's actually go ahead and uh, leave things there. I'm glad that we had this conversation. We're going to uh, continue it. And uh, I think next week, maybe the week after I have Dr. Joanne Kong coming on the show, she is phenomenal when it comes to environmental issues and the way that your diet impacts that. So we're going to take this conversation. We're going to continue it then. So continue also right now to post your comments in uh post your questions in the comments or in the chat box, and we're going to save those for the future episode. And uh, Dr. Barnard, I'm very excited here. This Sunday, uh, you and I are going to be out at the Fairfax Veg Fest. You're going to be presenting on stage. I'm going to be emceeing. It's going to be really uh, a fun, great event. The weather's going to be great. This is going to be in Herndon, Virginia, which is right outside of Washington, D.C. Do you know what you're going to be talking about on Sunday? Yeah, we're going to be talking about how foods affect our hormone function and health. It's something that you and I've talked a lot about. But yeah, I'm very excited about it too. There's a huge splash in the Washington Post today um, all about the event. So it's going to be a really cool thing. I hope people come out and join us. So I will be there. I'll be signing I'll be signing my book, Your Body in Balance. And we've got a great, great speaker lineup. And it's going to be nice to get together live and in person. Isn't it though? Uh, uh, yeah. T. Colin Campbell is going to be there. Dr. Baxter yeah. Montgomery, our colleague, Dr. Jim Loomis, uh, Gwen Whitaker from Green Fair, she's going to be there. Uh, so many others will be there. Uh, Gene Bauer, also phenomenal when it comes to the environment as well. He's going to be speaking. So come on out and see us. Uh, we'll be, I'll be emceeing. Dr. Barnard will be on the stage and everybody else is going to be speaking there as well. So fairfaxvegfest.org is the website to go to to pick up your absolutely free tickets. And oh, 
Uh, let me break some news. Special announcement here for the exam room. We're doing a special live episode this Friday. Chef AJ is going to join me. We are going to go into her kitchen. We're going to talk about weight loss secrets while she is making, get this, cookies. I can't make this up. Weight loss secrets with cookies with Chef AJ. That is noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific here uh, for the exam room live. I hope that you will join us. Dr. Barnard, four ingredients, none of them added sugar, really low in fat. I taste tested these snickerdoodles and man, I'm going to bring you some because they're that good. That's fantastic. She's a ball of fire. It's going to be a fun show. She is. She is the best. And also a huge thank you to the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund for their support of the Exam Room Live and the Physicians Committee because it is their support that helps to raise our health IQs today. And the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund supports organizations just like the Physicians Committee that carry on Greg's love for animals by promoting plant-based health and working to end animal abuse while emphasizing programs that promote systemic change and also benefit people. You can visit them online right now at GregoryWriterFund.org. That's Gregory Writer, spelled R-E-I-T-E-R, fund.org. And Dr. Barnard, my friend, that is all the time that we have. I want to say thank you to you one more time for being here and enlightening us. An important topic, disgusting at times, certainly, <laughs> but definitely a, a very important one. And it, it gives us a lot to think about how really the choices that we make with the food that we eat doesn't just impact our health or the health of our family members. It literally impacts all of our family, all of our neighbors, everybody in our city, everybody around the world. It is a huge decision every time you sit down to eat. Is that a fair statement? It certainly is. It, it affects the, our, our bodies, our, the, the uh, planet, the animals we share it with. And it perhaps more than anything else uh, affects future generations. And so we've got the power in our hands to change things for everybody. And uh, now's the time to use it. All right. Thank you, my friend. I greatly appreciate you being here today. And to you, Exam Roomies, thank you so very much for tuning in as well. And to the crew behind the scenes that makes the magic happen, you guys are flawless as always. For everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again on Friday. But until then, keep it plant-based.